Name the cannabis connoisseur's pick. The Firefly 2 Plus delivers an unmatched cannabis experience. Created by former Apple designers and built using the same aluminum alloy bodies as NASA, the Firefly was designed with no expense spared. You deserve the best cannabis experience. And this is it. Get $25 off your Firefly 2 Plus order with the code PODCAST25 at thefirefly.com. That's code PODCAST25 at thefirefly.com. Name the cannabis connoisseur's pick. The Firefly 2 Plus delivers an unmatched cannabis experience. Created by former Apple designers and built using the same aluminum alloy bodies as NASA, the Firefly was designed with no expense spared. You deserve the best cannabis experience. And this is it. Get $25 off your Firefly 2 Plus order with the code PODCAST25 at thefirefly.com. That's code PODCAST25 at thefirefly.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is Daily Drop number 385. What's going on, everybody? So, we are on the eve of our first ever Ask Me Anything segment, and I've decided to host it right here on my platform at Spreaker. I have uh, the ability to do a live recording right from Spreaker, so that's what we're going to do. As for the answer, uh, the question portion, I'm thinking that while we're on air here at Spreaker Live, I'll be answering questions over at the Facebook page. So what I will do is put the link to the Facebook page in the description box tonight. That way, if you're not following the page yet, or you might not even know we have one, that way you'll be able to click the link and you'll know where to find me tomorrow night at 7 p.m., Pacific Standard Time. Now it'll be an open forum. Folks can fire off whatever kind of questions you want. I'm guessing most of them will be about the case. I'm sure most of you out there aren't too interested in my, uh, you know, sports gambling or my adventures to the middle of nowhere, right? That's not why you folks are here. So I'm guessing most of those questions will revolve around this case. But if you have any other questions about, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, things that I do in my in my spare time, stuff like that, books that I've read that I really like or shows or anything like that, I'll be, it'll be, I'll be ready to rock. Um, I'm guessing maybe we'll spend an hour, hour and a half together tomorrow night, something like that. I guess it'll depend on how many people show up, uh, how many people are interested in firing off questions. But I have a good hour and a half, hour, two hours blocked off tomorrow at 7 p.m., and uh, we'll be ready to rock. It'll be a good time. I'm looking forward to engaging with you folks. I'm looking forward to a little bit of back and forth. Now, I know I talked to a, a good a good number of you via social media already, um, either the the um, the Facebook page or on Twitter, and then obviously with the emails. So it's nice to engage with you with all of you folks, and this will give us a uh, the ability to make it a little bit more intimate, right? You won't have to wait around for me to get around to responding to your email a week later. (laughs) And uh, it'll be a way for you folks to, you know, fire off some, some burning questions that you might have. And hopefully it's something that you all find enjoyable and it's something that is fun for all of us. And if it is, We'll keep doing it maybe several times a month. Hell, maybe every Sunday. Instead of, unless you know, if there's no news, we'll do one uh, morning update or daily drop plus a live session. So we'll see how it all pans out. We'll see what the reception is. We'll see if it's something you folks enjoy. Because really, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, right? It's all about if... You you folks out there that are listening, if you're engaged, if you find the content useful, and if you feel like you're getting something out of it, right? Because if not, then what's the point? So I hope that with these Ask Me Anything sessions that we're going to start doing here, that it'll add a little more spice to it. It'll give you folks a little bit more of a look inside of what's going on in my life, maybe. So I'm pumped for tomorrow. I hope that you folks are able to join me. We I scheduled it right around this time, the 30th of December, because I figured most people are going to be home, you know, on vacation for the holidays. Uh, New Year's Eve is showing up. And 
It was solid advice from Twitter user Orwell Huxley. Solid advice. And thank you very much. So yeah, we, I decided to roll with the 30th. And um, I, I hope that you folks will be able to join me. And with the time I chose at 7 Pacific Standard Time, that should be a solid time for all of you in the United States. And for those of you that are elsewhere, I tried to make it a time where it will be feasible at the very least if you got up early or whatever. But if you miss it, no worries. It will be saved and it will be archived and added to the catalog as soon as the segment is over. As you all know, I don't bother with any of that editing nonsense. We, f- we get our, we get our uh, segments prepared here. We talk about what we have to talk about, and then we fire them off. So that'll be the same thing with this Ask Me Anything segment tomorrow. And hopefully all of you will be able to join me for the first ever Ask Me Anything sesh. All right, so... Our article tonight, we're going to go back to 2020, July 8th. And we're going to talk a little bit uh, about Darren Indyke once again. This is a guy who somehow has been able to avoid the spotlight. And when I say spotlight, I certainly don't mean you folks who are out there digging. Everybody who follows this case understands how intimately involved Darren Indyke was with Jeffrey Epstein and this whole entire operation. And we've talked about the structuring with Darren Indyke and how he was integral in what happened with Deutsche Bank. The 97 trips to pull out 7,500, obvious structuring. And this article we're going to read tonight is going to open the door a little bit more It's going to talk a little bit more about the jeopardy that Indyke probably has already found himself in over this sort of thing. This is the kind of leverage the government loves to have on you. And if you're a co-conspirator, do you really think someone like Darren Indyke wouldn't roll over on Ghislaine Maxwell if it meant him staying out of prison or him getting a reduced sentence? And when the government already has their mitts on you, their claws dug deep over another crime, maybe a crime that doesn't even have anything to do with the case that they're looking into, well, now they have leverage on you. And with Indyke being involved with Deutsche Bank and the structuring situation, it's very evident that the federal government most certainly has a a route to go if this is where they're looking to get this guy caught up. This is the perfect way for them to have him roll over and talk about all of these other people that were involved, whatever he might know. And I would think that what Darren Indyke knows is quite a bit. The guy's been around in Jeffrey Epstein's pocket as the in-house lawyer for decades. Him and Epstein were very, very close. And Indyke's name is littered all over. Tons of receipts. We know that Indyke was around for all of it. And was an intimate part when it comes to the financial aspect of this case at the very least. So the the feds having him on paper here involved in obvious structuring is the hook that they need, the kind of situation that they love at the Department of Justice. This is why this sort of thing, the mafia, you're not allowed to do drugs in the mafia or sell drugs in the mafia because they'll nail you for an unrelated drug charge and then they'll have you singing like a little canary about what's going on in the operation because you're trying to save yourself. And I feel like that's the kind of situation that we're going to find ourselves in with Indyke. I don't see how the government could not pursue him at this point. We know that Denise George is going to hammer time on this guy right now. We know she is doesn't trust him. She doesn't trust the estate. And she has subpoenaed a, a mountain load of evidence 
So Indyke is somebody that I don't know how he avoids criminal prosecution in this case. It would be, I'm talking hitting mega bucks type of miracle, in my opinion, that this dude avoids criminal charges. He might not have been involved in the actual abuse of these girls, but this dude helped build the whole entire framework of the financial portion of this at the very least. And he was somebody who helped the dark, dark, dark laundered money keep pumping life through the heart of Jeffrey Epstein's criminal enterprise with his offshore operations, his structuring, and all of the other financial douchebaggery this guy was allegedly engaging in. So like I said, we have an article from Above the Law tonight. The uh, author is Elizabeth Dye. Headline, Jeffrey Epstein's lawyer may need competent counsel of his own. And there's no doubt about that. This, remember, this was all, all the way back on July 8th, 8th of 2020. So this is a uh, quite some time ago. And in the months since then, you would have to think that the federal government is salivating. And I would not be shocked if Indyke turns state evidence or if he's already speaking with the authorities. Holy structuring, Batman! Yesterday, Deutsche Bank inked a $150 million settlement with New York's Department of Financial Services for the bank's failure to comply with anti-money laundering laws in its dealings with Jeffrey Epstein and two small foreign banks. So, we covered this at length when it first happened with Deutsche Bank, the $150 million fine, how it's a slap on the wrist, and how it's the institution could care less. Why? Oh, they, they couldn't care less, okay? They, they will pay the $150 million and keep it moving. That's why it's so important for these executives at these places, places like Deutsche Bank, J.P. Morgan, and the other financial sector uh, institutions, it, it, it's important for these executives to be held criminally liable if they're the ones that are steering the ship, if they're the ones that are making sure that the financial institution looks the other way, if they're the ones that are in bed with people like Jeffrey Epstein, the institution should have to pay a fine, sure, but there should be criminal liability for whoever is in charge of the department that this is occurring in. If you're going to make big bucks, you have to take some responsibility when shit goes south. And none of that happens in the financial sector. It's everybody's running for the hills, pointing to the next guy, and the can just continuously gets kicked down the road. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll get him next time. The next time there's a, a, a meltdown. That's why when I heard the phrase, too big to fail, I wanted to put my head through a wall. While my 401k was getting hammered during the financial meltdown, these clowns were busy catching a tarp bell out. And then they have the audacity to put the screws to people a decade later during a worldwide pandemic. And nobody is up in arms about this. Nobody is yelling and screaming about the banks picking up the tab for the $453 billion stimulus package to give every American two grand. I'll tell you what. I would do a complete auditing of these banks. I'm sure if there was a complete audit done of these banks, a good portion of that money could be recovered and pumped right back in to the economy, in, in infrastructure. But it, it, it'll never happen, right? The banks will continue to do their song and their dance. They'll continue to send their bought and paid for politicians to Washington, D.C. And we will continue to suffer from the money laundering and the financial scheming and the general disregard for anybody who isn't part of their so-called elite society club. In the consent order, DFS describes Epstein's attorney making 97 cash withdrawals on his client's behalf, totaling $200,000 over just four years. And that is the epitome of structuring. 
when I was doing my Title 31 training, when I worked for Cantor Fitzgerald, <laughs> it was, this is exactly what one of the, scenari- the scenarios basically was. You can't structure these, you can't pull this money out at, uh, uh, the, under the $10,000 mark at the $7,500 mark to um, make sure you go under that $10,000 sum that would trigger the paperwork. But yet he was able to do it 97 times at Deutsche Bank. And regulators decided that after looking at everything and all of the evidence in the case, that Deutsche Bank was negligent to the tune of $150 million. And while it's all fine and well, What about the executives who are in charge of all of this nonsense? When asked why he needed so much money, the unnamed attorney claimed Epstein needed it for travel, tipping, and expenses. In other words, payoff money, hush money, and money for Lord knows what else. But I highly doubt it was for travel, tipping, and expenses, okay? First of all, a guy like Jeffrey Epstein doesn't strike me as the kind of guy that's pulling out C-notes and shoving them in pockets. Tipping. You mean trying to pay off young girls that he lured to to his uh, uh, Palm Beach mansion? Is that what you mean by tipping? Because if that's what you mean by tipping and expenses, okay. It's ludicrous. Ridiculous, whatever word you want to use to describe it, it's that. That Indyke, who is under this huge shroud of Jeffrey Epstein's fallout, is not only still walking free, but he's in charge of the estate. How does any of that mesh up? How does any of that make any sense? This guy should have been ejected from the estate Long ago. In fact, he should have never been accepted as part of this estate. There has to be some sort of way around it, some sort of way to get him ejected. And to tell you what, I'm pretty sure a federal indictment would do the trick, wouldn't it? But the attorney had questions of his own for Deutsch. In May 2014, the attorney inquired into how often he could withdraw cash on behalf of Mr. Epstein without triggering an alert. Right then and there, it should have been over and done with. When they, when, when somebody asks you how to structure, you have to report that. I couldn't even talk to people about that, right? If they went over $10,000, I couldn't tell them why I needed their identification, none of that stuff. All I could tell them that it was for tax purposes. And I had these little cards that explained all of the the laws and the rules that I would have to give the person. And if they were to ask me about structuring, right away, not even a question, I would have sarred them. So I don't know what was going on at Deutsche Bank. And this moron, a lawyer, is asking this kind of question. Have you noticed that these people, these people from so-called polite society are not really good criminals when they don't have cover being put down for them by the best criminals in the world, people at the CIA and other intelligence agencies. These people are not smart. These people are not criminals. And they're not built for this life when the pressure gets turned up. You put these people in a room with an investigator and a hardened interrogator, and these people will crack And the more I think about it, and the more I learn about Indyke, I would not be shocked to find out that he is already cooperating with the government and has already provided a proffer statement. Now, again, folks, look, I don't have direct evidence of that. I'm putting two and two together here, right? We're putting the pieces together. We're reading between the lines. And if Maxwell was arrested... And, and is being held without bail, you would think that Indyke, who played a significant role in at the very least paying hush money off to these girls, let's just say that at the very least, that would make him complicit. So it, it's fishy to me that Indyke has not been swooped up yet. It's very fishy to me that he is still walking free. And I would be utterly shocked if when all is said and done, we don't find out that he was a cooperating witness against Maxwell. That would be my guess. Again, just so we're clear, 
I don't have any evidence of that. That is speculation on my part due to the way this case has moved and what we know about Indyke, but yet we have seen no movement from the authorities. So something has to give. Relationship Coordinator 1 sent an email to the branch manager stating that Attorney 1 asked how often they could come in to withdraw cash without creating some sort of alert and asking, is it once a week, twice a week, once every other week? The bank has represented that it has no record of any response. There should be no response. But I'm guessing in this financial sector that the manager probably came down and spoke with Indyke one-on-one. What they spoke about and what they came up with is anybody's guess. But I'm certain that Indyke was not ignored. Jeffrey Epstein's guy? Highly doubt he was ignored. With all the money in that bank and all the money Epstein was steering towards that bank? Oh yeah, this is a preferred client. This is somebody who's going to get the time of a branch manager. And he most surely is not being ignored. That's 100% certain. As far as it not being on record, I could totally see that too. Why would anyone want to keep that conversation recorded or on record? Dude's breaking the law. If he, if whoever that branch manager is helped Indyke structure, then he's in huge trouble. He's somebody that should be investigated as well because you can't be in a position like that, a branch manager at a bank or in a financial institution and you're helping people structure. Hell no. Hell no. DB claims to have understood this as a question about its own 7,500 limit on third-party withdrawals, not an attempt to evade triggering a mandatory report to the Treasury Department for a cash transaction of $10,000 or more. And that's what happens. The second it's $10,000 and one cent, it becomes a whole new animal under Title 31. And they were trying to beat that. They were trying to structure it so it did not alert them that it was Title 31. That way they could avoid the taxes. That way they could keep this money moving around without anyone knowing where it was going, without any receipts. You know, all of the stuff we've been talking about here on the podcast for a while, but really for the past few months we've we've zeroed in on this whole financial aspect and this is why. This is the kind of shit that was happening. And when you see it, it's just, as if it was just this one story, you'd be like, oh my God, what a moron this guy is. He's trying to get over. Okay, I get it. But when you add it all up and you see all of this happening over and over and over again with a bunch of different players on the same stage and in a bunch of different sectors, be it academia, the modeling world, finance, you have to say to yourself, all right, how many coincidences are there? Or is this a well-oiled criminal enterprise that is moving like nobody's business? And to me, after everything we know and all of the people that have been outed, it is quite obvious that this isn't just a bunch of coincidences, okay? This is a man, Jeffrey Epstein, and a woman, his his alleged co-conspirator, Ghislaine Maxwell, who had this whole entire operation running like they were mafioso. They had money laundering, sex trafficking, honey trap, you name it. These people had it going on. In 2017, Epstein's lawyer asked again, but this time he specifically wanted to know whether a withdrawal transaction in excess of up to of $10,000 would require reporting and, upon being advised that it would, broke up the withdrawal transaction over two days. They should have never allowed it. The second he asked that question, if he tried to take out less than the, the, the 10 dimes or put in more than the 10 dime, nope. You're not making this transaction, sir. And not only that, I don't want to do business with you anymore. Your account is frozen and you'll have to speak to the branch manager. The SAR should have been filed and the ball should have been rolling. This dude is engaged in structuring. This is a crime. This is a federal crime and he should go to prison for this, if nothing else. So again, I really strongly believe 
that Indyke is cooperating at this point, what else could it be that's keeping him out of the clink? Why, said attorney, asked the bank teller, instead of Mr. Google, about Treasury reporting triggers is unclear. <laughs> it's pretty snarky. I like that. And it's true. So this guy's running around asking the bank teller about structuring, asking the bank teller to help him commit crimes. What an absolute douche lord. And you see, these people are not as, as intelligent as they think, folks. You know, they come off like they're so intelligent, like they're so much better than the rest of us. Screw that. These people are absolute morons of the highest order. But if he had done a minimum of research, he'd probably have discovered that the government takes a rather dim view of structuring transactions to evade reporting requirements. 100%. I had to take classes on this shit. It was serious business. If you missed somebody, uh, a Title 31 transaction, uh, forget about it. We're talking, you get suspended at, at my job. Possibly terminated, depending. So it's a serious deal. It's a big deal. And the fact that it was just, you know, ah, no big deal over at Deutsche Bank. And, you know, eh, we'll do whatever we want over here. We don't got to worry about Title 31. That's a big problem. And that's another reason why I'm so adamant about this sector being regulated. I have had enough. I have had enough of their games. I have had enough of, enough of their 25.5% finance rates. And I certainly have had enough of them bankrolling the biggest, most crooked oligarchs and criminals in the world. Faced with the attorney's apparently unequivocal admission that his goal was to evade federal reporting, not the bank's own rules, Deutsche's bank's compliance department sprung into action. No, not really. But they definitely gestured in the direction of action. And this is typical. Millions and millions of dollars of Epstein's money was in there. They don't want to rock that boat. They want that dough to keep on growing. They want it to metastasize, right? Pour a little water on it like a gremlin. That's what they want. They don't care about money laundering or human trafficking or structuring. If they can get away with it, they don't care. They only care when they get caught. An anti-money laundering officer, among others, spoke with Attorney One and advised that A, his patterns gave the appearance of structuring, B, this pattern was unacceptable, and C, he would be provided with additional information about CTR reporting requirements. This is exactly what I was just telling you folks, right? We, ha Like I said, we had this little card that I would slip to the high, the high rollers, people who didn't understand what CTR and Title 31 is. And Indyke, all he had to do was take a trip out to Las Vegas and come to my casino and he would have got a face full of it. When some jackass sportsbook manager like yours truly is more of a watchdog when it comes to the financial sector than the actual financial sector, folks, we have a four alarm fire that most certainly needs to be addressed. Attorney One represented that he had not intended to structure cash withdrawals. Bank personnel found attorney, attorney One credible and permitted him to continue to withdraw cash from his own and Epstein's accounts. That would never, ever have happened at my sports book. And believe me, I didn't work for a squeaky clean operation, okay? I'm sure all of you are familiar with, uh, you know, Cantor Fitzgerald. And for those of you who might be interested in uh, the sports gambling world, I know you know about CG. So not the squeakiest operation in the world, right? But when it came to Title 31 and my shop where I was in charge, you better believe we had our shit together. They asked him if he was committing a crime and he said no. Case closed. Yeah, that's it. We'll work on the buddy system. We'll just let you self-verify. No wonder the bank got whacked for $150 million. $150 million. Not enough, right? Nowhere near enough. But it's a start. And all of those executives that were involved, they should be charged criminally as well. And they should face personal liability for this. And every single one of these money laundering dollars that is taken 
from these people should be pumped back in to the American people's pockets via infrastructure or otherwise. Enough with these banks getting rich. Then, in 2018, just before Deutsch closed the branch nearest Epstein's house, the same attorney made a $100,000 cash withdrawal. When asked, he explained that Mr. Epstein needed the funds for tipping and household expenses, which seemed to satisfy the bank. Oh, well, isn't that nice? Imagine having that kind of clout. You just walk in there, you're like, yeah, let me get 100000 Um, Oh, yeah, it's just for tips and expenses and shit. No worries. Oh, that paperwork? Yeah, you don't got to file that. Dad, Jeffrey says, Uncle Jeffy says you don't got to file that paperwork. I mean, that's basically what's going on here, right? That's what it seems like anyway. It's such a joke that Epstein had so much power and so much reach. So much power and so much reach that he manipulated the financial markets. And not only that, that his reach was so long and so strong that he was able to finesse prosecutors, federal and state. You would think that their colleagues at the SDNY and elsewhere would be foaming at the mouth to scrape this egg off of their face. To right this huge wrong and finally bring some justice where it's needed the most. The ball's in your court, SDNY. What you gonna do with it? It did not, however, satisfy the New York State Department of Financial Services. And if it wants to lean on this attorney for cooperation against Epstein's still living co conspirators, it appears to have ample leverage. Great job, Attorney One. And that's what I was getting at earlier when we were talking uh, at the beginning of this article. The leverage that the federal government has when they catch you up in a different crime is... It's a lot, all right? Enough to crush you under its weight. And that's what they live for. Process crimes, shit like this. They want to walk you into a, uh, a lie under oath, a perjury trap. That's what they do. And for attorney number one, <clears throat> Darren Indyke, he's in big trouble and he's exposed. And when you're exposed and you're part of a criminal enterprise and there's blood in the water and a feeding frenzy is occurring, well, my friends, it most certainly is every shark for themselves. If you'd like to contact me, you could do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter at B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. All of the links that go with this episode will be found in the description box. And remember, folks, Ask Me Anything segment tomorrow. If you're not a follower of the Facebook page, make it happen. I look forward to hearing from you all tomorrow. And I look forward to our nice Ask Me Anything situation. So all of those links, like usual, will be in the description box. The Facebook description box. And that way, tomorrow, when we're broadcasting live, that will be where you can ask all of your questions. And I will do my best to answer as many or all of them as possible. All right, everybody. I hope to see you tomorrow at the AMA. And if not, remember, it will be recorded and added to the catalog. All right, everybody, until then, I hope you all have a fantastic evening. And we will pick up where we left off tomorrow. Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. improves children's health by developing better treatments and technologies. As one of the top children's hospitals in the nation, we take on the most complex, rare, and life-threatening conditions because all children deserve a healthy future. And with our new pediatric focus research and innovation campus opening this spring, we'll be able to generate and share even more discoveries. Learn more at childrensnational.org slash innovation. 
This week at Macy's, use your coupon or Macy's card and get an extra 20% off just in time for Valentine's Day. Save on top of already great deals like 35 to 55% off dazzling diamonds, gemstones, and more. And sleek handbags and wallets from Kipling, Nine West, Inc., and more top designers. Now 25% off. Plus, Star Money bonus days are going on now. Learn more at Macy's.com slash star money. Savings off sale and clearance prices. Exclusions apply.